so um Gerald and Emily um just so you know um I get put on the spot quite often to do these and I'm so happy that Chris volunteered this time to <laughs> to help out <laughs> um but it's um I, and, and I'm especially glad that, you know, I don't, my, my, well, I, I won't say, I, I'm just happy that I won't have to be that, um, since you guys are here and you're, you'll be doing a lot of the talking. I'm, I'm, I'm excited that I don't have to, <laughs> I'm excited, I'm excited I don't have to fill anything in. So, <laughs> so the six o'clock. Hi, everybody. Hi, Victor Valley College students and any everyone else joining us tonight. We're really excited about um, the opportunity to discuss the art of Gerald Clark, a Kuwia artist, and his daughter, Emily Clark, who is a poet. Um, Gerald's work is right now in the library where Chris Nunes is at, and he's going to show off some of that art tonight. So, um, you know, stay tuned for that. That's going to happen in a bit. Uh, before they started to talk, I just wanted to go over a couple of reminders for everyone. Um, you know, the One Book, One College uh, program is designed to spark conversations on campus and to get people um, involved in the shared reading experience that surfaces big ideas. And, um, you know, one of the best things about being in college is having, as I say pretty often, having ideas in the air and getting to try on new perspectives. So before we get started, I just wanted to remind everyone that some of some academic, excuse me, of some academic norms. The first one is that it's okay to disagree. So I know we live sometimes in a social media environment where uh, it might seem like it's not okay to disagree, right? Where civil discourse has sort of been pushed to the side for more uh, frustrated discourse. Um, and, you know, that also means that you, you might hear ideas that you don't agree with tonight. Um, but what we would just like everyone to do when they're thinking through these ideas is to practice self-focus. So if you're feeling frustrated or you're feeling angry because your beliefs are being pushed in, in any particular direction, um, that might be an indicator that you are growing and you're hearing new ideas and um, that's okay, right? Because that's what the conversation is all about. Um, and we just ask that no matter what, in, in our classrooms, on our campus, anytime we're having these conversations, that you at least stay willing to try on new perspectives and ideas. Um, and the um, indigenous author Daniel Heath Justice writes, let me move my video thing over here, but um, that there's as much diversity and disagreement in indigenous communities as in any other group. There's never one single voice or perspective that speaks for all. No single way of being, of being that captures the complexity of the human experience. Um, and that's just a reminder that, you know, part of the reason why we do these things and part of the reason why we hear from um, authors and speakers is so that we have the opportunity, which is a pretty, which really is a privilege to look into communities that haven't always been featured in um, the mainstream media or in, in even mainstream textbooks and to learn about their experience um, in comp and, and the complexities and the beauties that arise from them. Okay, and so from there, I'm just gonna hand it over to Chris Nunes, so thanks. Well, all right. Thank you so much, Jamie. And thank you for everyone uh, for taking the time to join us this evening. We're so excited. If you haven't had a chance to come by, I am right here uh, on campus here at VBC. And we have, of course, a tremendous, can you hear me? Oh, okay. And of course, we have a tremendous art installation uh, right here on campus. Uh, thanks so much to uh, Mr. Gerald Clark, who is the featured artist here. Um, there he is. You know, uh, Two years ago when we started uh, having the One Book, One College program here on campus, it was really a call to unite folks to uh, be able to have some sort of common ground amongst all layers, whether it be a student, uh, a faculty member, a staff member, management, or just somebody coming onto campus who had no idea, no um, experience with BBC or any kind of connection. We all can always use that easy way to connect with others. 
Um, <clears throat> so reading the literature, of course, is one way to do it. Um, but the other is to use our other simple senses. And today, that's exactly what we're going to do. Whether you have a high appreciation for fine art and culture, or whether you are just a student um, who's here trying to learn and pick something up new, or if you're just uh, part of the community and you are leaning in to engage in one of the great things that we have going on here in our campus community. Welcome, and you very much are welcome. Um, so to get things started, uh, I I don't want to give away too much just because Gerald is going to talk uh, a little bit about himself, but uh, Gerald Clark is a renowned um, artist who um, practices over many mediums. Um, he's going to take an opportunity to show you some of the different ones. We have everything from uh, three-dimensional I don't even want to show the projects yet because I know Gerald's going to, but they're right behind me. So if you haven't had a chance after tonight, you're definitely going to want to stop by and see all of the excitement. In addition to that, he has brought a full spectrum here. Uh, his lovely daughter, Emily Clark, is a wonderful poet, um, and uh, she's going to share some of her works interspersed um, with uh, us going over the art. The idea here is for us to understand what drives um, uh, Gerald and Emily's art forms, how it is that they actually work on them and what um, steps that they actually take in their mediums. And then of course, we're gonna talk about the overall impact that this artwork and this poetry has, not only on the Kahia culture, uh, but on uh, us as Americans, as Southern Californians, as Rams here at BBC. So, Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Mr. Gerald Clark. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, yeah, really, really happy to be here tonight. Um, really um, pleased with being able to, to speak with you tonight and, and also to be able to present. This is the first time I've been able to present with my daughter, Emily. And so I think this is going to be something that we'll probably be doing more of in the future. So I'm really uh, happy uh, to be here and uh, to share my work with you. I'm going to share my screen real quick. And I will tell you too that, you know, it's, it's really humbling to, to be able to talk about your work and what you're passionate about and what, what you do, right? And, 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 you know, people taking time out of their busy lives to, to, to do that. I, I'm, it's humbling and I, I appreciate you being here. Um, and um, so when uh, Emily and I, we were going through what we might present tonight, uh, we thought, and this is the wonderful flyer that uh, the staff there at uh, Victor Valley College, uh, College put up to us, uh, put up for us, as well as the image of uh, entering the library where my work is. Hopefully you've gotten a chance to see it. Um, oftentimes when I show my work, uh, people hear about the Native American artist who's going to be showing their work and then they show up and they see my work and they're kind of confused and disillusioned and such. And I love the, uh, thank you for the, the those uh, uh, academic norms, uh, Jamie, because um, that, that, that last bullet point particularly. You know, there is no singular thing about what Native America is. You know, we're uh, over 500 different tribes and we all have our own histories, our own belief systems. And so, uh, yeah, it's, there's a lot of diversity. And so, uh, you know, again, really, really happy to be here. And when Emily and I were talking about um, uh, tonight and how to get started, we thought maybe Emily uh, uh, would, would kind of start us out by setting the tone for what we're going to talk about tonight uh, with one of her poems. Emily? Hi, everyone. My name is Emily Clark. Um, I've gotten a great introduction so far. I am also a fourth year creative writing student at UC Riverside, as well as a small business owner, among other things. So to start off, I wanted to share this poem called Moochim Call, which translates to We Are Still Here. And basically, I thought it was important to start with this one because it really uses stereotypes as well as um, Native American history to kind of explain how, um, despite many of the historical atrocities that have been committed against Native people, we are still here and we are still arguably thriving as a people and as a culture. And from the title, you can see it also uses that phrase, Moochim Call, which I was actually lucky enough to take Kahuya language classes at UC Riverside. So I've been including um, little phrases as well as some 
full sentences in a lot of my poems lately because I was able to have that experience. So I thought it was important to include that in the beginning of this, um, this event as well. So Moochim Call. Moochim Call, we are still here. We are still here, us noble savages, us heathen redskins. We are still here, us scalped skulls, us pioneer murderers. We are still here, us massacred zombies, us dug up wounded knee skeletons. Moochim call, we are still here, us heads mounted on Thanksgiving steaks, us history museum specimens. We are still here, us Christopher Columbus discoveries, us uneducated alcoholics, us casino money guzzlers. Moochim call, we are still here, us generations erased by trauma, us starved, hanged, and beaten bodies, us mouths struggling to use severed tongues for native one. Moochim call, we are still here, us first peoples, we are still here, us beating hearts. Okay, I'm gonna turn it back to my dad. <laughs> you know, uh, I gotta say, you know, obviously I'm a proud father, right? But um, I get emotional when I hear her read because, you know, it's obvious she knows this history and it's a heavy history. And I think that's a really heavy poem. And, you know, one of the things that I tell my, my students, I, I'm a professor of ethnic studies at UC Riverside, and one of the things I tell my students is, you know, we've all been kind of catfished uh, in the, the way that we've been taught U.S. history. And, you know, most Americans, they don't really know the real history of, of Americans' relations and uh, interactions with indigenous peoples of these lands. And it's that weight, it's that weight. And I, I see that weight in this poem. And, and this is the weight that I carry into the studio as well. And it's, uh, you know, I think people are waking up to the real history. And I see teachers maybe changing, you know, the story of how native, um, native history is taught. But I will say that, that um, at the same time, and I've told my daughters this as well, we are the ultimate success story because, you know, we survived, Indian people in this country survived genocide. And so it's not all tragedy. It, it, we are the ultimate success story here in the United States. And, um, you know, I, uh, she's a miracle. My daughters are miracles that they exist. I'm a miracle. Our people are a miracle. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, that's, that's, we're setting the tone for what we're going to be talking about tonight, which is um, oftentimes Americans want to hear the type of history that validates their own uh, experience and their own ideas without wanting to really hear our stories. And so I appreciate Emily's work because there's power there, I think, because she knows, because she grew up here. And speaking of which, so this is a view of the Kuya Indian Reservation. This is where I live. I'm talking to you from right now and where uh, Emily grew up. And those little dots there in the pasture, those are our cows. Uh, and, you know, one of the benefits of COVID is I, I've been going over to my uh, aunt's house. She's 86 years old. And we sit there on her back porch and I took this photo and we sit there in late evenings and we watch the cows and I've been blessed to hear her stories and her memories. And so I, I strongly encourage all of you to, to reach out, you know, to your elders in your communities and, and hear those stories because there's, there's power there and there's importance. And that's our history. You know, it's an, it's an oral history, and, but you got to take the time to, to, to learn these stories and these histories from these people. And um, I, I think this is a, a site not far from where I'm talking to you right now up in the mountains. And these granite boulders, do you see the little indentions here or there? Those are mortar holes where our people uh, ground acorn, which is one of our traditional foods. And for lack of a better way of saying it, those, those, those uh, granite boulders, they're hard as a rock. And so uh, some of those mortar holes are, are like 10, 12 inches deep. And so you're talking not just hundreds of years, you're not talking just hundreds of generations, you're talking thousands of years. And so for me, uh, history is a, a chapter in a book. It's not a class you take. History is all around me. It's in the stories my aunt tells, and it's in you know the landscape right here, uh, in in the in the rock. 
And then, you know, also objects. So that's my hand. I know a place where there's actually just pottery laying on the ground, right? That's real history that tells me that I belong here and we belong here in this place. And Emily, I want to apologize because when I edited this slide, I think your feet were actually over here in the corner. <laughs> this is up on Kuya Mountain when we went up there years ago. And, and, you know, of course, I didn't take the pottery. You always leave it, you know, but it's, it's just that science. It's, it's a real history that you feel, not, not just understand up here, but you feel down inside you, you know. Now, I do want to be, you know, upfront uh, about who I am. I always try to be upfront. And this is one of the works that's actually there in the library on your campus. And uh, this is the title is The Problem with Color Theory from 2002. And indeed, I'm going to show work and, and the works there at the, uh, the library. There's some newer things, but there's some older things. I've been doing this now for about 30 years. And my dad was native um, and my mom was a, a white woman. And uh, they were, you know, interracial marriage. They, they were married in the, in the 60s. And so, you know, I, I'm a professor of ethnic studies now at UCR. And, you know, we often talk about the black community or the white community, white supremacy, right? Uh, we talk about Asian Americans, oftentimes referred to as yellow people, right? Or we just had uh, St. Patrick's Day, right? So everybody's wearing green, right? But, the, you know, the fact of the matter is, uh, and the, the, the title, the problem with color theory, my dad being red of the red people and my mom being white from white people. Well, you take equal amounts, and those of you who have had <laughs> art class, you take equal amounts of red and white and you get pink. <laughs> but if you look at me, I'm not pink, right? And that's a really dumb, dumbed down way of thinking about human beings, you know? And so there I am in the center. I'm not pink. I'm a human being, right? And so that's what this, this, this piece is about, is about, you know, this kind of, these kind of stereotypes. And Emily included some stereotypes in that, in that first poem. And so this is something that, you know, we think about, right? That these are, these are, uh, ideas that are imposed upon us. And another idea, uh, which I think a lot of people might be surprised about is, you know, I grew up as a cowboy, as an Indian cowboy, you know, and a lot of people don't know the history, again, here of these lands that we now call California. But when the Spanish missionaries came to these lands and set up the mission system, you've probably heard, you know, learned about in your history classes, they brought with them livestock. And did you know that the California Indians were some of the first cowboys here in this state? And so my family, we continue this tradition to this very day. I was feeding cows this morning, uh, our herd here on the reservation. And so that's my dad there in the center, rough and tough Indian cowboy. There's my dad and my grandfather from back in the 70s. And I can't believe this photo. They, they actually have pistols <laughs> on their belts uh, to the side. And then there's me on the right. So what am I, like four or five there? And they've already got me up on the tractor, you know? So this is how I was raised. But one of the things I have to say is that, um, you know, here's, a, here's images of our cattle herd. And we do this to this very day. And I, it's, it's a nice life, I think, when combined with my life as an academic, but also with my life as an artist. Sometimes as an academic and an artist, you can get too much in your head. And these cows, they, they forced me to keep it real, you know, and, and it's a nice compliment. And the other thing too is in art, I work with my hands, I make things, the physicality of actually making things, and it's mimicked in the ranching that I really like. And so oftentimes when we talk about tribal communities, we talk about tribal sovereignty, right? So I am a citizen of the United States. I am a citizen of the state of California, but I'm also a citizen of the Cahuilla Band of Indians. And along with those rights of being a citizen, uh, I also have obligations to my community as well. And oftentimes I'm asked to come dig for funerals and things. And I'm, I'm a formerly... Uh, elected tribal leader. And so there's a lot of obligations that comes with that. So there's an image of me there in the middle of the mix there with our, and we have Indian cowboys from around various reservations around Southern California who come to my house end of May, 1st of June and help us work our cattle and stuff. And so a lot, oftentimes, you know, identity, a lot of times these stereotypes that Emily was talking about in that first poem are imposed upon us, right? And so one of the things that I, I believe in is sovereign identity, is being who we are, right? Making no apologies and telling our own stories. And a good friend of both Emily and uh, uh, mine is uh, Gordon Johnson, who's a longtime writer 
uh, for the press enterprise. He's now doing screenplays and he's writing novels and short stories. And this is a quote from Gordon that I, I really like. It says, I can't speak for everyone. I love, I love the humility there, right? But I think native art is an expression of cultural sovereignty which in the biggest picture is the ability of native people to determine who they are. And so when I, you know, people ask me, do you make Native American art? And of course we know what they're talking about, right? Whether feathers or certain colors or images or what have you, and it's all I can do, right? And so, you know, what makes my artwork uh, indigenous or native or Kauia specifically is the lens that I view the world. My perspective on the world has been formed by my community and how I was raised here on the reservation. And with that, I'm gonna kick it back to uh, Emily to talk about the, the, these ideas that, that I'm talking about as, 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 as identity. Okay, so this is a poem I wrote in 2019, but it's been sort of a work in progress for the years after that. Um, it's also published online somewhere, and there's multiple different versions of it floating around, which I always like because I like um, the idea that this talks about identity and it's constantly changing and constantly being edited and then put into an old version and put into a new version. So this is the version I decided to share with you today, and it is another one about stereotypes, which often are a big part of my work being a Native artist, but this one also talks about in this second stanza um, just the reclaiming of those stereotypes and how identity is what we make it. And especially for Kauia people, identity is so important and so rooted in both land as well as culture. And that's what this poem is really talking about. So reservation required. In this version, we are baby mamas. In this version, we are Disney Pocahontas. In this version, we are panhandling on the corner of spirituality and alcoholism. We keep at least one long loaded shotgun in every plateless car. In this version, we are not brown enough and we are not white enough. Our voices are replaced with the mechanical cha-chings of neon slot machines. In this version, we are Kmart Halloween costumes a plastic Coachella trend atop the sunburned heads in which we have never once been given a second thought. In this version, we are the minority of minorities. We are the tokens of academia whose names do not live on any professor's quick to dismiss tongue. But I don't wanna be your Edward Curtis photograph. I don't want to go down in history, just another specimen, a female body left to rot like her ancestors' regimen. So in my version, we are static. We are sound and sinew woven together by wrinkled brown thumbs. In my version, we are bone white doves. We are scaled and goat eyed. In my version, we are people. We are standing side by side along earth's backbone dancing to a song sung to us under the breath of the wind. So that's that poem. And I also should have mentioned before I read that Edward Curtis is a photographer that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, his work is just of native people in these kind of like historical looking images. And it's very well renowned, um, but oftentimes he used like clothing and artifacts that wasn't relevant to that native person's culture just to make it seem more authentic and to fit his idea of authenticity. And so I thought that was a very important detail to add into this piece because it really helps drive those stereotypes home and also shows the juxtaposition, juxtaposition between um, what people want us to look like, what people want native people to come across as and who we really are. And I will return it back to you. I, I, I can't help but uh, it, it, towards the end of that first stanza that um, uh, we are the minority of minorities. Uh, I think back to the last election when they were going through the presidential election on CNN and they talked about the white vote, the black vote, you know, the Latinx vote, and then something else, 
<laughs> and I guess that's where we were lumped into, you know. And so I, I, I feel that totally, you know. And that second stands, I really like where you're, you're like, you're taking back, right? You're taking back ownership of that sovereign identity that I was talking about. And I know, uh, you know, a few years ago, I, uh, you know, oftentimes when I make art, I find that the, the best art I make is when it's connected back to my everyday life. And so one of the things we do with our cattle, we do an annual uh, branding where we brand the cattle uh, uh, with our brand so people can't steal them or what have you. And so like way back in 2002, again, people asking me, well, you know, do you make Native American art? And, and I, I kept at getting asked that question. I got kind of mad, to be honest with you. So I made this branding iron with the word Indian on it. And I was like, and you notice the, the, uh, uh, the title to the distinguishing uh, collector, because it was, it was, the, you know, I, I, I don't like being categorized actually, you know? So I made this branding iron kind of as a, as a protest, right? And then a couple of years later, I was like, you know, I should heat that up and, and use it. And so I actually created this print below it called branded where I actually burn the image. And then later on, I framed it and, and, and showed that as an artwork. And I, I actually returned to that branding iron. And it's this idea of, of these stereotypes being imposed on us and then trying to steal that back, you know, to take it back. And so I've been doing lately since 2016, I started doing these branded prints where I actually, I actually do the text in like Photoshop, print it out, and then I, I um, uh, heat up metal and bend it to try to match the font the best I can. And I create branding irons, custom branding irons, heat, heat them up like in that bottom image. And then I actually burn it into uh, paper and I make these prints. And I have a lot of fun. I do different configurations with them. Here's another one. You can see where it's actually burned all the way through the paper and then it gets a little bit less evident as it goes down. This idea of, of forgotten history, I think. And then I was doing a residency and another uh, artist, this was in Vermont, and another artist gave me this book and it was the title is Disinherited, The Lost Birthright of the American Indian. And I said, oh, thank you, put it right there. And then I just branded it, you know? And one of the things, and one of the, the works in the show that I'll talk about in a minute was, um, you know, this idea of who controls the narrative, right? And so, you know, over 90% of the books about Native Americans and our history and our culture are written by non-Natives, you know? And so it's this idea of stealing that knowledge back, you know? Uh, you know, California's history, we talk a lot about the gold rush, right? And the mining of, of gold in central and northern California. But, you know, our cultures have been mined by academics and by historians and authors for, for centuries. And so by grabbing these books and branding onto the, 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 the surface of them, and some of these are, are actually there at the, at the uh, library, it's I'm taking that, I'm taking ownership back. So when I, I brand one of these books, I actually uh, will open, after I brand it, I actually open to the title page and I sign it and date it. So now it's no longer their publish, you know, work. It's now my artwork. So it's kind of vindictive in a way, you know, and it's, it's the ultimate plagiarism in a way, but it's this idea, these ideas that we're taking back all this knowledge that's been taken from us, right, and mined from us. And so this idea, who controls the narrative, right? It's very important, I think. And so um, this book, this, is, this book is, was written by a non-native, but it was actually the first book that actually considered Native American art as art and not simply as trinket or artifact or ethnographic, uh, you know, sample specimen. And this was done in the 70s by J.J. Brody. And uh, he was actually criticized for actually treating native art as art, actually. And he, he actually um, wrote about how a lot of the collections in the world worth you know, millions of dollars were actually not the best artwork that, that you could collect from native people. And so he was criticized for that. So that's why I did the dollar sign. So I actually have a branding iron in the form of a dollar sign that I, I branded on the cover. And then this is one of the works that's there at the library. And so inside there are those little capsules. And if you remember when you were a kid, you can get a rubber ball or some cheap jewelry or something. 
And so inside the, the machine, there are all those capsules. And what I did was I took books actually written by native authors. I cut the pages out. I destroyed some books. I apologize for that. But what I did was I folded up those pages and I put them each in those capsules. So when you interact with the work, you actually get, and the title is Indian Wisdom, and you actually get some Indian wisdom from these native authors. There's poets, there's sociologists, political scientists, uh, uh, fiction writers, it's all in there, right? And it's this idea of, of, of getting, you know, letting America know about these wonderful, this, this real Indian wisdom of, of these authors. And so, you know, this idea of who controls the narrative, it actually led Emily and I both to actually travel to Standing Rock, uh, the Standing Rock Reservation during the No Dapple protest in 2016. And so there's Emily there next to the Standing Rock flag. And then I actually, uh, we, our tribe, we sent our tribal flag up to that protest. And so there I am. And I just got to tell you, it was so cold. Emily, do you remember how cold it was? It was really, uh, really cold. And you know why did why did we go? I, I wanted to go because I was seeing a lot on the, the the mainstream media, and I was also seeing a lot on social media. But I'm to the point now where I don't trust either very well, and I wanted to go and experience it for myself and see what was really going on. And it was really an eye opener, and it was a an amazing amazing experience. And uh, for those of you who don't know, the Standing Rock tribe is right on uh, uh, the shores of a lake, the, and this river feeds uh, the, the, the lake, and um, so of course they were trying to protect their water, right? It, it, it made so much uh, sense to me that this was so important to those people, right? And not just their water, but everyone downriver, the millions of people downriver, and so from that experience, I actually made a sculpture uh, this is uh, entitled Leaks. And the picture there on the bottom right, that's actually the color of the pipeline that's bringing oil through these lands, through tribal lands, right? And um, so I, I installed this in a, in a, a gallery uh, initially up in Portland. And, uh, you know, uh, Emily and I, we, we witnessed like uh, police and FBI uh, uh, ATF, sheriff's departments. It, I've never felt that kind of oppression. It was, it was frightening, actually. And so to, for their presence, I used these, uh, these dolls, these stormtrooper dolls. But you can see I kind of dressed them in this garb that I was seeing at Standing Rock. And they had guns. They had uh, video cameras. They had drones. They had th these clubs. And it, it, it was really, it was, it was an eye opener. And you notice I, I painted on the pipe Empire Partners Limited Incorporated uh, because, you know, I was connecting it to this kind of Star Wars phenomena. And, you know, the, 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 this, the Star Wars franchise is so popular and the good people are good and the bad people are bad. But at that protest, it was all mixed up. It was chaos, right? And I couldn't understand how come you know, people were being beaten and shot with rubber bullets. It, it was it was really something, you know. But I want to point out there. Look at the title, leaks. And so what you see below there, the black that you see coming down, those are are uh, electrical cords, and they go down into these kind of puddles or these piles. And you could actually pick up the headphones and their audio cables, so you could listen. And I recorded stories of people who were actually there. And there at Standing Rock, we didn't have very good uh, cell phone coverage. And so there was one little hill called, they called it Social Media Hill, where you could actually go up there and send out tweets or, or what have you. But the leaks, you know, the pipeline has leaked since it's been, you know, since it was put in the ground. But also there were, there were leaks, there were stories that were leaked out. There, there were, right, the, the, this is our oral tradition and we were talking to people. And so people could come and hear the stories of people who were actually there, which I thought was really, really important. And, um, it, it, but this idea too, that, you know, like we watch, we watch these superhero movies, like Marvel, right? And all the, and, 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 and we side with the good guys, but yet in, in a lot of these protests, whether it was Black Lives Matter protests that happened the summer before last, or whether it was No Dapple, you know, America, doesn't know what to do, right? Take sides. And, you know, if, if you'd been there, I think it would have been really clear, right, who, who the good guys were. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Emily. 
Okay, so I wrote this piece 2016 pretty much immediately after our trip to Standing Rock, just as a response for my own, I guess my own emotional well being, as well as a call to um, all people, not just Native people, to think about environmental rights and water rights. Because I think oftentimes, if there are things like Standing Rock that aren't happening, or we're not seeing this constantly in our social media feeds, those issues kind of go in the back of our minds. And so my idea with this piece was to bring it to the forefront, talk about Standing Rock in a sort of outside perspective and outside way, not directly talking about it, but use that experience of mine and of my dad's to kind of do this call of action. So it's called Earthlings, and I'm actually going to open up my document. OK, Earthlings, a tribute to water protectors fighting the Dakota Access Pipeline. Pure mother draped in shades of billowing flora, so lavishly dirty. Home longs to be a soft rounded edge. She yawns and we suck her breath into our greedy mouths, claiming it as our own. Her skin is clay. It echoes with the slap of our bare feet on hard ground, crumbling apart with each step we take. Our mother's veins are silver, violent rivers. We slurp and dribble, lapping at her blood to survive. Blood is human currency. We love to watch it clot. It dwells inside centuries of memory. A woman post labor kisses her baby, blood clinging to her proud mama mouth and smudging her child's skin like watercolor. Coyote cleans the thick bloody fur of her mate with a gentle pink slobber until he is pure and healing. A boy gazes at his reflection, red rusty gushes from his nose, the results of his attempt to protect a little sister. He holds his head high. Blood clots at the edges of travel stop bathrooms, the plastic shell of a tampon rests lifeless at the bottom of a trash can, womanhood leaves stains. Our bodies are handfuls of clay, pinched from the organs of our mother, her heart, her lungs, her uterus. Layers of her rippled skin fade from green to brown. Her scars are paths for us to walk. Cruelty is human currency. We love to watch ourselves topple like dominoes. Our sacred mother is hemorrhaging, thick black poison has flowed inside her rushing veins and created a corrupted bloodstream. We have left her in ruins with steel and plastic. We have sliced open her skin time after time and allowed greed to consume her. Mother, teach us to respect, teach us to grow, teach us the power of our bare hands, teach us to protect a home. We have forgotten how to cherish. We have forgotten how to cushion. Teach us to heal you. Teach us to heal ourselves. We must learn to bandage our past without discarding it. Mother's breath has slowed. Her blood has been poisoned with oil, the black snake. Forgiveness is human currency. We love to watch our colorful glass cups overflow with water. It is ice cold in our throats. All right, Dad. <laughs> That's so heavy. Jeez, wow. Uh, and, and you know, so so that heaviness. So so like I, I mentioned that this is the the kind of like the weight, right, that we carry around. You know, we 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 see in the world. And so some people might be curious, like this piece that is actually in the library there. So this is um, similar to the branding prints that I do, but this is, I just make these rubber stamps with letters and I spell stuff out and I do different things and I stamp it on an ink pad and I just stamp it on the paper and I do that over and over again. So this uh, obviously self-portrait um, started, you know, it, it took me, oh, probably six or eight hours to complete. And uh, if you go to the library, you'll see it's it's uh, fairly, fairly large, maybe four feet tall or what have you. But what I did was in, in stamping that is um, 
everything that you see there is text. So there's there is a detail of the text. And what I did was I took, um, I think it was the sixth most prescribed depression meds, the names of those depression medications. And I put them all in rubber stamp and then I just started stamping my image, right? And I, you know, I've, I've battled a bit of, of depression. Uh, I don't know how I couldn't with the history that we're talking about here. But really what I was really talking about was I'm, I'm trying to convey that heaviness, you know, uh, that that we we deal with in, in terms of, of this history and you know the more you learn the, the it's almost like the heavier it gets you know and I know uh, my own great grandpa Pia Lubo uh, actually died in prison over a, a murder that he didn't uh, commit but um, at the time 1912 um, you know uh, Native people had very little rights here in the United States and and, and that that's the other thing too is is these atrocities that we're talking about in history many times Americans try to 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 explain that or explain away by saying well that was then this is now right but there's something called intergenerational trauma and a couple of Emily's poems I think maybe you've noticed that she uh, refers to uh, the idea of alcoholism and I myself I have the potential of being at least a third generation alcoholic and I I, I, I tell my students that I mentioned that in artist statements uh, because that's part of who I am. That's part of that intergenerational trauma. And oftentimes America tries to explain that away as, well, natives are more susceptible or whatever. And by doing that, you see what they're doing. They're minimizing that impact of those boarding schools and the tragedy of, of losing your, your children, right? And, and, and the government taking them away. The, the tragedy of the murders, the rapes, all those things, right? The, these abuses that our people have, have uh, experienced over the last couple hundred years, and so this is you know, this is kind of what if what what this piece was about is it acknowledging that because you know uh, Native American people are some of the most stereotyped people in, in this country, but also some of the most romanticized. And I never want to be uh, accused of romanticizing. You know, got to keep it real. I think you know it's really important that that that. I, I tell it like I see it and like I've experienced it. So one of the things I've done in the past is I've been doing these road signs now for about two decades, actually. And so the first, uh, you know, I got out of grad school, I was feeling good about myself, you know, this a big artist or what have you. And so I, I, I started doing these signs and I did a, a, some on the reservation here using our own language, our language. Emily talked about taking a Kauia language class at UCR. That's a new development that we started a couple of years ago. And it's an endangered language. And so what I could, you know, anytime I can use my art to help promote relearning our language. So this is Netach Muka, which is I am singing. Uh, this is the name of our creator. Mukut is the name of our creator. And I like the what using the arrows. So it's like, you know, the creator is everywhere, right? And then I recently did some as a public art commission down in Palm Springs. And I've actually, the, the, the original ones, I actually included English language. Now I've, I've, I've completely abandoned English language. And I don't think it needs it. I think, you know, mesaha is our word for rattlesnake, right? Isil, coyote, kish. Uh, for home or, or structure. And so I, I don't even think I need that. And why do I do these? I want to remind Americans that this is an ancient land. There's no such thing as the new world. This is an ancient land and we've always been here. But I also, for Native people, I want to validate our contemporary experience as 21st century people here in these lands that we're valuable and we exist and, and we should be acknowledged. And so that, I think that's part of what I like to do in my, my artwork. Uh, in our, our my paintings there. I'm influenced by everything. That's one of the the, the uh, questions I often get. What, what, what influences you? And uh, so this is uh, uh, the Yucca Whipplei, uh, Ponwell is our Kauia name for it. This is a source, uh, I think a lot of you are probably familiar with this plant here in Southern California. Uh, it is used for food as well as for fibers, for making rope and sandals and different things. And I've surrounded it with this halo, this arched canvas, right? And this halo of these birdsong rattles. We don't use a drum, we use uh, rattles. And I was at an, uh, Emily and I were both at an all night sing just last uh, Saturday. And so I gave it this halo because I want to I want to emphasize how important this plant is to my culture. And what was I influenced by? Well, maybe you can see uh, just images of the Virgin of Guadalupe I was influenced by. And I see this kind of body halo and I see her surrounded. We do not worship this plant, 
but it's important to us. And so this is why I'm trying to kind of emphasize that. So I've done, you know, I'm into plants actually, and I've done paintings, I've done sculpture. There's a sculpture that's 10 and a half feet tall. And, and this idea, like, is this, is this Native American art? right? I think it's just, it's just a plant, right? Well, yeah, it is, right? Because I made it. And so I'm pressing this kind of creative sovereignty, right? That I, I as a Kahlua artist, I am going to make what I think the Kahlua art should be, right? And, and, and not listen to the dominant culture, which is trying to romanticize and stereotype me, but to, to this idea of creative sovereignty. And indeed, here's a couple of baskets, coil baskets that uh, uh, were made by members of our, our peoples, uh, historically, and indeed, basketry is the art form that the queer people are most known for. Uh, but I, I, I'm not a basket maker as such. I'm a sculptor. I'm an artist, right? And so what I, let's see here, lost my cursor. So I started making basket sculptures. So this is my continuum basket flora. And this is made all out of crushed aluminum soda cans and beer cans. Okay, and so th this basket was influenced, this basket sculpture was influenced by those historic baskets. Uh, but I'm also, I'm a 21st century citizen, right? And I, I mentioned, you know, the history of alcoholism within my family and intergenerational trauma. And so the beer cans are in there. Uh, we also suffer in our community from diabetes. So the soda cans are in there, right? I never want to be accused of romanticizing our, our, our people, you know? And, and what's, what's amazing is when you get back and look at it, they look pretty cool. They're actually, people like them and they're attractive. And so I was approached in 2018 to do one for the uh, Palm Springs Art Museum. And so I, I just did this sketch and I sent it to them. And they said, yeah, that's cool, you know? And so you, just based on this sketch, I did the largest one I've ever done, which is eight feet across. And believe it or not, people, that's over 1,800 crushed uh, beer cans and soda cans. And kids always ask me, you know, like, did you drink all those? I was like, no, I would be dead if I did all that, you know. So, uh, but you can see the 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 images. They're they're highly influenced by um, you know by th those traditional baskets because I know the history and I'm bringing it into like the 21st century, right? But but I'm talking about some serious issues too: the alcoholism, the diabetes, but also just recycling you know did you think that was really a new concept that's an ancient concept and then here lately and i'm pleased to say that uh i i collaborated with another artist who is actually on the uh, meeting right now uh this is my native american jewelry collection and i partnered with birdie Pulskamp, who, who is on the the meeting so hi birdie glad you're here and uh she's an amazing beadwork artist and so I had this idea of doing, you know, Native American jewelry is, is very popular. So I was like, well, let's do some jewelry, but let's talk about the higher incarceration rates by Native people within, you know, the, the current system. Uh, uh, and, and so uh, this is, uh, uh, she, she did this amazing beadwork on these handcuffs. Here's another version. And so these are brand new. These are just within the last year or, or so that I've, uh, uh, worked with Birdie on. And so you can see, I have no selected medium. I'm all over the place, but I do what I think needs to be made, right? And, and represent, you know, uh, uh, issues, contemporary issues, but also uh, kind of shine a light on our histories as well. And, I, you know, we're getting here towards the end. I just want to mention that future projects here. Um, Emily, do you want to talk real quick about your yeah, so this is a reading I'm a part of um, this Saturday. I need to get ready for that. So this Saturday, um, it's in LA at the Reverie. I don't know how you say it. It's just like a big space um, that a lot of artists use. So it's at 4 to 6 p.m. And there is a link. Um, I can, I'll put my social media in the chat if that's okay with everybody. And the link is actually linked on it um, for you to sign up and get a seat. So there's gonna be food, there's gonna be drinks and there's gonna be two other poets as well reading their work. And it's different native women and their perspective written through specifically poetry. So it's one of my first in-person events since COVID. So it's gonna be really exciting. And again, I will put that my social media so that you can contact me or get the link if anybody is available to come to this event. 
Yeah, great. And and so and then that's so that's Emily has that this Saturday. And then myself, I've been working on a project. I'm I've been working hard today, actually, uh, which opens on April 9th up in the Joshua Tree area, part of the high desert test sites uh, uh, installations. And I'm doing 500 flags that will be installed in a dry lake bed. Uh, and the each flag features a fish that would have been in that lake. Uh, you know, like a thousand years ago. So I'm trying to remind people that the desert hasn't always been the desert, that, that time, uh, we have a very temporary view of time in America today. And it's, uh, you know, uh, indigenous, we, we, we think long term, right? Uh, not short term. And I should point out too, that as far as future projects, uh, starting Monday, uh, me and my daughter Lily will be installing, a, we're doing a, a mural uh, at the Agua Caliente uh, Casino Resort there in Rancho Mirage. And so we'll be working on that all next week. So lots of irons in the fire, uh, sometimes literally, uh, but that's uh, part of what we do as artists. You, you stay busy and, you know, um, you, you do what you do, right? Uh, so we're going to end uh, tonight with uh, Emily uh, wanted to offer up this poem. Yeah, so when we were talking about what we were going to talk about today, um, I emailed my dad all the works that I was thinking about reading. And he was like, um, can you can you read something a little bit more hopeful, a little bit lighter? Um, as you can tell, I'm like the teensy bit intense. So um, I thought I would offer up this piece, which is written about the traditional cemetery on my reservation where I grew up. Um, dad showed those pictures in the beginning of his slides. And so it's um, really just about ancestry and about the feeling of land and ownership of land or feeling like you belong to a certain place, as well as just traditions. So this is called Cemetery. These graves marked by mustard weed and ant hills are homes to the lizards and stink bugs, breeding grounds for the rattlers and kangaroo rats. There was a wooden cross buried into every other mound, two cedar limbs tied together with twine from that morning's hay bale, the dew on the dead daisies sticky and sweet like the burnt honey sun setting behind the marble cross that cast tall shadows onto the dark hill of graves. These are our ancestors fogging up the night with their sacred songs. These are our ancestors living beneath our bare feet, glancing up only sometimes to see the cemetery fill with people holding melted candles, blackened vases, and each other's hands. Thank you. Wow. Uh, and with that, uh, we say in the Kui language, which is, it's good that we gathered here today, this evening. Appreciate your time, right? And uh, I believe we're going to do a little Q and A, huh? Absolutely, absolutely, Gerald, Emily, thank you all so much. I'm I'm sitting here taking notes. I I'm so excited. Actually, I was just in Palm Springs about six weeks ago, and I saw your uh, is it Isil? Is that how you say it? Oh uh, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah, the wolf. Yeah. So wonderful. You know, I know obviously the uh, Kuiya land is so important to, to the tribe and to your people. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about literally geographically where it is. I know you're there right now, so people have an understanding. And then tell us about, uh, if you could, a little bit of the way of life and how it works specifically with your land. Well, the, the uh, Kuiya territory, like, so I, uh, our, our band, we're up here in the mountains, about 4,000 feet up above the Coachella Valley. Uh, but, uh, you know, th this kind of area from, uh, you know, the, the Riverside area was kind of Western, uh, going over to Corona, and then all the way back through towards um, Salton Sea. Uh, for those of you who don't know the, the, the history, um, before there was the Salton Sea, there was Lake Kauia, which they say was uh, at least seven times bigger than the current Salton Sea. So it was a very large uh, wetlands. Uh, there and so the Kuya people are through the Coachella Valley, the Chocolate Mountains, uh, and going towards uh, the you know Joshua Tree area, and then um, up here in the San Jacinto Mountains. And and you know like like uh, I said, Emily and I both and and my daughter Lily, we were at an all night sing at the Agua Caliente Reservation Saturday night. So we all, um, you know, we we have relatives on, at other reservations in the area. We get around. 
you know, we go to cultural events and uh, have family around. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a community that exists and, uh, and thrives. And it's, it's doing so without a lot of attention from California or from the United States. You know, Emily and Lily, my other daughter and I, we go out and we gather acorn in the fall. We'll gather yucca blossoms and cook those. And, you know, people don't know that that's still going on, but it's, it's going on pretty, pretty, pretty often, actually. And, and like I said, we, we sang uh, Saturday night and the girls dance and yeah, it's, it's really a, a special existence. And, you know, we t I talked about how Native culture is stereotyped and romanticized. The thing is, I think most Americans really want the authentic, the, the real story. They just don't know where to get it you know and so so we're here that's what we're doing i think is offering up the you know the real story yeah and i was the i love that you started with that comment about living history and about the mortars and the rock and um the book that we're reading the, the marrow thieves it's really it's about you know that cultural wealth of being able to survive on a land that was the that was indigenous to begin with and um I, I was just so cute. I thought that was such a, that really got me thinking because I was thinking, okay, the living history and about um, how we oftentimes have that hierarchy of the written word over the oral word. And um, I just was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that, about um, how the land itself is, um, you know, part of that, that tradition. And I don't know if I'm going anywhere really with that question, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Well, you know, when I teach my classes, one of, one of the things I speak about often is the indigenous intellectual tradition. And my students have never heard those words put together before because of this idea that we're spiritual and we're intuitive. And when, when we're stereotyped that way, when we're romanticized that way, it takes away, right, our intellects. And the fact of the matter is, through this practice of traditional ecological knowledge, uh, the native people here in California could live in all these different environments and not just live, not just survive, but thrive. And the Spaniards, I'm kind of a nerd. I like to read the Spaniards, their journals, and <laughs> not one do they, as they're coming through California, you never hear the Spaniards say, oh, the poor Indians, they're starving. They can barely live. What, what they talk about is how they're thriving, how they're, they're healthy, they're well-adjusted, right? And it's because of our our intellects, our, you know, our spiritual life, our intellectual life, our social life was all tied to the land. And so that, that, that it was an intimate relationship, right? And the thing is too, that it was so specialized, what I call it, it's a custom fit, that what the Cahuilla did here in this area of, of Southern California, you, you could just go uh, north 200 miles and it wouldn't work. It was specific to specific environments throughout the state. And throughout the country. Thank you. Um, just to shift a little bit, Emily, um, in uh, in your work, you have the line: uh, "We must learn to bandage. Oops, we must learn to bandage our past without discarding it." Um, and then, of course, we kind of got into talking about intergenerational trauma. Um, as as you know, a young adult, a student, um, is especially, you know, how do you? how do you kind of balance that you know having grown up on the reservation and learning of your people's history and the oppression that you've suffered how do you balance that with you know dealing with today's world and you know owning that narrative um well so that line is really about just healing and um healing from historical trauma without forgetting why that historical trauma happened and without forgetting that that historical trauma was part of the reason that I am here today. So in terms of just dealing with historical historical trauma and historical instances in like an academic world, I would say that a lot of Native students, especially Native students my age, have an issue with it just because oftentimes um, at UCR, it's a little bit different, but oftentimes you will be the only person in a history class talking about Native history, the only Native person, right? And so that's a very, I think, a very rocky road to navigate um, in terms of not wanting to be 
uh, provocative in any way, but also not wanting to feel like you didn't stand up for yourself if that was necessary. And so I think it's important that you brought it up just because many young Native academics deal with it every day. But I think the most important thing is to just be um, authentic to yourself. I always think about um, the fact that a lot of times I think Native people and people of color in general in academic settings are pushed to constantly um, not just stand up for themselves, but constantly have an opinion and speak that opinion um, if it feels, if other people feel that it is necessary, right? And so I always like to say that if you don't want to, as a Native person or as a person of color, if you don't want to be that voice, you don't have to be, right? And so I think finding that balance is very important. I totally agree. Wow. Thank you for sharing that insight, too. Um, actually, I'm going to stay with Emily, um, has poetry, has writing always been your medium? Do you uh, practice any any other kind of uh, um, artistic practices? And uh, what was the other one? And then how, an how long have you done family, that? Huh, Chris? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, excuse me. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I when I first started writing, I was like a fiction writer through and through. And then somewhere along the line, I really fell in love with poetry and I love performing and reading my work, which I think goes back to that oral tradition that we were talking about earlier. Um, but I also do I do like a little bit of photography, but my other main thing is I'm a beat artist as well. Um, you saw some of Birdie's amazing work. She's been a sort of mentor for me. Um, but so I am as of like the last couple of years, I'm a small business owner where I sell my beadwork. And I really enjoy that because I think in poetry, it's all, a lot of it's all in my head, right? It's very um, academic, it's very thought, um, thought based. And I really love like the physicality of beading and just doing something with my hands. So that's something that I'm also very um, involved in and really happy with. Well, I already know that we're going to have people on this call who are seeing your earrings and want to know. So if you wouldn't mind in the chat, would you add where um, folks can go and see some of your beadwork and purchase some if, want, if they want to? Yes, I will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And don't forget uh, this Saturday, the 26th, uh, the link is in there as well. Um, Gerald, so I, I and I apologize, I didn't want to get too much into into your bio because it really is um, quite a story. Um, have you always been into art and, and producing art as a way to cope with things or um, tell us how you got started with that? Yeah, so so uh, I think it really comes from just being poor. You know, we, we didn't get toys and things like that. And so, you know, you, you, you fix stuff or, you know, you build your own skateboard ramps or forts or whatever. And so we were always just kind of tinkering and, and I, I like to make things, you know, I, I do believe creator is given us each like a, a special power, you know, and my, my power is really to, to make things. I'm a maker. I, I like that. And so, you know, in, in school, I, I've always been good with my hands and I've always had to work too. <laughs> and so, um, you know, th that's the thing that people don't understand about art. It's a physical activity. It's, mm -hmm. if, it's not just a, being a philosopher because then you don't make, you think about everything and you don't make anything, you know? So, you know, it's, it's a physical activity. And, I, and, and as, as far as like ther therapy, right? Uh, it does help me to stay busy. It, I, I feel better when I'm moving around. That's why I like the ranching too. It, it helps fulfill that for me doing something, you know? And I think, you know, like, like uh, I think other people know this too. I think that's why like uh, crochet and knitting, uh, Emily's beadwork, right? Or, or uh, you know, I teach cordage classes and my daughter, both my daughters help out with that. And there's something very therapeutic about using your hands. It's mm. soothing to the to the soul, mm. I think. And when I when I taught, uh, you know, like uh, I taught at Idlewild Arts, that's where Emily graduated high school. And I would show this the art students how to make cordage just one day a year, just for the heck of it. It was always the quietest <laughs> class period <laughs> of the year because there's just something so meditative about it. So that's that's what helps me actually. You know, there's that question at the top of the Q&A about how art can, and, and I know that that one comes from our resident poet in the English department. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, he's he's had some, you know, in the political environment from the last several years, he's, he's definitely channeled some of his rage into his art. But I was wondering if you guys could answer that question, how art can provide an alternative to rage. 
Well, I think Tim, thank you for that question because um, you know I return. I, I I started doing those branding uh, irons and the prints like way back in like two thousands, and then um, I, I I dropped it for a while, and then actually uh, it, I returned to it in twenty sixteen with. Um, the, the Trump administration, that election, because I saw more violence and hate in the country. And when I brand these works, it's kind of a violent act, actually. I'm not a violent person at all, but but by burning that image into that book or into the paper, it kind of mimicked the, the violence that I was seeing in uh, America and social media. And not just, not only like the physical violence, but also just microaggressions and the, the uh, uh, you know, Lindsay, you talked about, or Jamie, you talked about how uh, people don't uh, agree to disagree anymore. It's just like this oppositional kind of thing. And so I saw that anger and that's how I put it in the work. And it, it helped me. I don't, Emily, you might have a different take on that. Yeah, um, I, I always say that I write my best poems when I'm really, really pissed. And I think <laughs> that's true with a lot of artists today um, in terms of the political stuff going on. So I think that not only can art and specifically poetry be an outlet for artists as people um, to fuel that rage and kind of um, expel it. I also think that once that is into a form that is the art piece that it can go a step further and just sort of do the work as activists that maybe we weren't able to do when we were feeling that rage or when we were so enraged over these issues and it can also kind of you know sharing rage is a way of kind of trauma bonding we say um but there are other people right that feel the things that we feel and i think by sharing art that is so fueled by these deep emotions whether it be rage or sadness or even joy we're kind of creating this community that can go on to fight for the issues that we believe in as well as do other important things um Gerald, uh, you use a lot of different mediums in, in your artwork. Um, so the question is, is which comes first, the, the mediums or the artwork that you're going to create with it? Um, you know, how do you, uh, my, what's your practice? Yeah, my, my process is, it, it always, I've never been the, the type of artist that uh, like was trying to come up with ideas. You know, like uh, my, my, my burden is I have to choose which idea I want to pursue. <laughs> And ideas, you know, there are good ideas and there are bad ideas. And if it's a bad idea, you get into it and it dies. But if it's a good idea, you, it doesn't just, uh, you know, like uh, uh, create itself, right? Uh, a good idea leads, it has children. It, it leads to other ideas, right? And so usually I start with an idea and then I say, okay, how would this idea be best expressed? Is it a painting? Is it a, a performance artwork? Is it a photograph? Is it a branding iron, right? And so I, I start with the idea first. And so when people say, what's your medium? They ask me that all the time, you know, and I, I just say kitchen sink. It's whatever <laughs> I can get my hands on, you know, and, and that keeps it fun for me. And one of the things that I tell art students is there's nothing sadder than an artist that plagiarizes themselves like over and over again, doing the same thing. I have no interest in that at all. And, and actually, when I'm in the studio, I don't like to be comfortable. If I get comfortable doing something over and over again, I quit doing it and I try something brand new because uh, that keeps that, that keeps me on edge and it keeps me thinking. And you know, I, I wish I could <laughs> say I was talented because when I'm in the studio, it's just a constant struggle. But it's that struggle that gets you, you know. And for I don't know if I need to tell any of the art students this, but. You know, uh, I, when I teach art class, studio art class, I, I tell my students, if, you, if you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. Failure is the learning process. It's one of the most important things you can do. And so, you, you know, my art students, even when some a project doesn't turn out and they fail, as long as they understand where it went bad, that's an A in my mind, because you learn from failure. All right. That's the, the creative process versus the replicating process. Absolutely. Yeah, Emily, how about you? Can you talk a little bit about your creative process? Yeah, so I think I often get inspired by just what I read. I read all the time and I love reading um, poems and poets that I'm a fan of. And so then the creation process, I think, goes from inspiration, whether it be 
the things I'm reading or the rage I'm feeling. Um, and then it sort of blossoms into drafting. I have like tons of notebooks. I'm like notorious for never finishing a notebook because I constantly have them written or like thrown around that I can write in. And so I um, try to keep notebooks with me a lot. I try and write on my phone notes app just so I can always have that outlet. And so it goes from the drafting process, which is very messy and physical for me. I can't really draft on my computer. I love like writing and feeling it. So I do that handwritten drafting process. And then somewhere throughout the time of this of the poem, right, it goes onto my laptop. And then the editing process is actually my favorite part. And one of the ones that I feel like takes um, the longest. And as you've seen from when I talked about my work, it is constantly, constantly happening. I don't think my poems are ever finished. And I know um, someone in the chat asked for my published works and I'm always like a little bit nervous to like, you know, give that out because I'm like, well, I wanted to edit that one last thing and now I can't, <laughs> you know? So um, yeah, I think like from, you know, from inspiration to editing, it's always an ongoing process. And I think many artists and poets will agree with that. But again, like, you know, the editing is my favorite and then it's somewhere in between, I think it gets published or it gets read aloud in events like this and it feels sort of finished. And then I think the process is as over as it's going to be. Mm -hmm. I think it's I think it's interesting that she's talking about editing, you know, obviously right in literature or poetry. And I think I do the same thing. You know, my my process is just a series of mistakes. And you just keep going and keep editing, and, keep, and, and then you, I finally reach a point where I'm like, okay, you know, I, I, there, there's no more edits to be made, and then that's when I consider something done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh gosh, I know you guys just made a lot of English professors really happy. So you know, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's wonderful. Thank you. Hey, I, I do want to. Uh, I, I think the the participants might be interested in, in hearing this, but mm -hmm. I'm real pleased. Uh, Kauia, the Kauia Band of Indians, our tribal chairman, is actually one of the attendees uh, on tonight's meeting. So that's I'm honored that oh. he's uh, joined us. As, and there's a uh, tribal members uh, as well. So that's very cool. Oh, thank very you. cool. Would you mind uh, acknowledging them? And, and thank you again for joining. <laughs> uh, uh, Mr. Uh, chairman, Daniel Salgado, is uh, <laughs> our senior, is our uh, tribal chairman. And I served on him until January when I got off tribal council. Uh, a lot of, lo lot of heavy, heavy lifting that has to happen in, in tribal government. So really mm -hmm. nice that he's joined us tonight. Well, thank you, Chairman, for joining us. And, and Gerald, thank you for that service. Wonderful. Jamie, do yeah, uh, you have we'll a, be, another question? Sorry, Chris. Yeah, well, so we'll be, um, the, the participants that were on tonight, um, we, we we only had about 47, but that number is going to be much higher today um, because we'll be watching this recording in classes. And then there are other people that have talked to us and said, oh, I can't make that time. Will, it be will the recording be available? So um, so that's really exciting. And I'm, I'm glad for the turnout that we had on a Tuesday night. <laughs> So, um, and then Chris, you're going to show us a couple of the works that are in the library, right? I am, Is that why I you're am. walking around? <laughs> yes, yeah. So I'm just going to do a, a quick walkthrough here of the library that we can see where the uh, where the exhibit is at, and then uh, Gerald, feel free to jump in if you want to add anything as we go on this uh, quick tour. There we go. Yeah, so that's the work. That's the work that's uh, yeah b behind Jamie there, and uh, you know again one of one of my sculptures that were were kind of inspired by the Kauia, uh, um basketry tradition, and then also just using the hearts and, and painting those in, in the colors that are referred to in our uh, Kauia creation story. That's my hand. Uh, pull a mold off of that, and you know like the you see the DVD that blank disc there. And for me, that's almost like a contemporary uh, version of like abalone shell, which is often found in various uh, uh, forms of regalia, tribal regalia here in California. And so that's my modern take on it by using <laughs> the, the blank disc. Love that. Here we have some of the brands. Oh, there's the, there's the one uh, uh, Indian branded print that uh, uh, I did uh, from that first brand. Yeah, and here we have several others. <laughs> there's a branded book there's a couple of the branding irons there's that original book yeah <laughs> I didn't know what people would think about that but uh that's you know 
a lot of uh, like American history, how it's taught, you know, mm -hmm. is again, it's not our story. It's America's story that they want to believe about us. Right. Mm -hmm. And and so it's not real. It's not real, you know, and so that's what I'm referring to on that. And there's that gumball machine. Mm -hmm. Oh, that one's that uh, Indian wisdom. And uh, yeah. you can see. Uh, so I do have a sense of humor. So by putting my own photograph on the front of that, uh, I'm, I'm making fun of myself, really, ultimately. And I'm doing we this have, kind of artist pose, too. <laughs> we, our our um, art department, um, Anna Marie Bolo, is doing something really cool with that, too. So if you guys have a chance to go and see it at the library, then please do. Yeah. And, uh, and then I, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, Chris, Christopher, if you can zoom in on the top of the gumball machine. Mm -hmm. So that little figurine there, I bought that at a craft shop and you've all probably recognized the end of the trail. You see that on coasters and different things, but you see what I did is I broke off his spear and I, I replaced it with a pencil. Mm -hmm. So this is talking about those authors, you know, and how, how defeating it must be to have your work overlooked, uh, you know, uh, because, you know, the, the, the bookstores and libraries are inundated with these books about Indians that are written by non-Indians, you know? Mm-hmm. That's a, our word for basket. And um, something that Anna, that I'm sorry, that Emily's work um, points to too. I know we didn't have time to talk about this in the um, um, in the rest of the uh, lecture, but you know, points to the violence against women that's happening. That have oh, sorry, I'm having people come in. So there's people behind me but it points to that violence and um and I, I i i don't know i wondered if you guys could talk a little bit um maybe about the stereotypes that appear in those works that you know that are um sorry i have people behind me so i'll, I'll let you take over Gerald, can you tell us a little bit about these sculptures uh, yeah, th those are bronze works that uh, I do. I cast bronze here at my studio. And uh, the, the middle ones are based on these kind of baton forms uh, from our eagle dance. And then I actually have that heart. Again, this idea of the heart. Uh, so many times we put so much uh, emphasis on the intellect, right? But the I don't think the intellect's up here. I think it's down here. It's down here in our, our bodies, you know? And so I love I refer to the heart. And then there's that, that rattle. Um, it's an oversized gourd rattle. Uh, the handle is actually a softball uh, bat <laughs> that I uh, <laughs> carved and fit. And actually, um, you know, it's, it's that tradition, our bird singing tradition that we participate in and wanting to pay homage to that. Absolutely. Well, th thank you. And there's more artwork here on display in, in the library. So again, if you haven't had a chance to come by and check it out, I can't encourage you enough. It will be here until June, at which point we are very much looking forward to uh, hosting Gerald and Emily here on campus. So we hope, uh, of course, that you all join us for that as it comes forward. And um, and just getting involved again um there's events that if you would like to learn more or take a deeper dive um very much able to art installation happening out in uh joshua tree is that right perfect yeah. and then we and then we have our poetry reading happening this saturday down in la so make sure you check the chat for more information uh, i want to thank again gerald clark emily clark for joining us this evening this has been uh both entertaining and then just really eye-opening. I, I have a, a whole pad of notes of things that I didn't even get to ask, but <laughs> I want to say th thank you all so much. Jamie, do you have anything else you'd like to add? No, just thank you so much. It's, it's really just been such a delight to listen to you guys and pick your brains and yes, thank you. Absolutely. So thank you very much to the Victor Valley College OBAC uh, crew for putting this um, lecture series together. Thank you so much for bringing your artwork here to share with us. And uh, we're really looking forward to seeing all of you later on uh, here at the library. And then, of course, in June when we have our reception. So thank you very much. And we'll look forward to seeing you all soon. Bye, everybody. Take care.